Okay, oh, we do have a ask the pastor question that I want to address real quick. Is it okay if we leave the lights off or does somebody, do you guys need the light on? No. No? Okay. Uh, the question is, does resurrection happen at a believer's time of death or at Christ's return? My question comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 and 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 23. Yes. <laughs> Short answer is, when we graduate from this life to the next, our spirit and our soul is immediately in the presence of God. Okay? Our body goes into Sheol, goes into the grave, goes into, I don't know, an urn on, on your child's mantle, wherever your body ends up. Uh, quite honestly, I don't care where mine ends up. I told Christy, slap me in a pine box and ship me down the river. I don't care. Okay? Um, but the physical resurrection where we are changed in a moment from the perishable to the imperishable, from the mortal to the immortal, happens at Christ's return. Okay? Now, I don't know all the specifics of how God does it. You know, I don't know if he just flicks our spirit and soul and thump, we land in the body that's rising up out of the ground. I, it doesn't matter to me. Okay? I know that Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? I know that Scripture tells us that we will be resurrected when Christ returns. Now, whether that's at the rapture, which is what I believe, or at his second coming, which is what some other people believe, I know that this body is not going to be the body that's resurrected. I'm going to be resurrected into a glorified body. Uh, man, I can't wait. <laughs> so I get tired of aches. And I know, I know, Vivian always tells me, it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the short answer. I don't know who wrote this. Your name was not on it. So I will leave it up here at the front after church. If you want, you can come up and get it. I wrote a little bit of a lengthy uh, explanation in there. So, wow, I got all kinds of time. So we are still talking about spiritual warfare. Um, going through the, the three maxims of war that we started with. Um, know your enemy, know yourself, we've covered both of those. Now we're moving on to know your battleground, okay? So we've talked about our enemy, the, the fallen angel, Satan, and his minions. Um, we've talked about ourself, which ironically also happens to be our enemy, because you know, there's not a lot the devil needs to do to get us to fall. We invent ways of doing it. Okay? And, and honestly, sometimes I get a little tired of people saying, Oh, the devil made me do it. No. The devil can't make you do anything. All he can do is dangle it in front of your face. You choose to pick it up. Okay? So, the devil can put a lot of pressure on you. But remember a couple of things. One, he can only put on you what God allows is restrained by God. So if something has come on you, it's because God is building you and growing you. Okay? If you fall, that's your choice. The devil can't make you fall. He can make things around you miserable. He can make falling look really fun. He can make it look like a pleasure. Okay? But ultimately, he cannot make you sin. Okay? So, we have the enemy, the devil, we have ourself, who also happens to be our enemy, our predisposition, our capacity to sin, the, the entire way we've trained ourselves before we came to Christ, those habits that we've developed over a lifetime, all of these things conspire against us. Paul even goes so far as to say... Um, what a wretch I am. Who, who can save me? And he says, praise God, Jesus Christ. Okay? So today we're going to talk about the battleground. What would you guys consider the battleground that Christians face? <clears throat> What's that? The mind. The mind. That kind of falls under yourself. 
But that is a battleground. It's a huge battleground. Everywhere. Everywhere. How about the culture, the society that we live in? Okay? Um, this world, this world system that is opposed to and hostile to everything godly. Okay? This world system is opposed to us. It hates us. It has no use for Christ or Christians. Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about the battleground. Number one, first point, James chapter 4, verse 4. I'm going to read it to you. You adulterous people. Ouch. Wow. Kind of a rough start. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay? I want you guys to turn there. James chapter 4, verse 4. I want you to highlight it, underline it, make a note by it, whatever you need to do. Because this is one of the critical issues facing the church. James chapter 4, verse 4. James starts off by saying, you adulterous people. Now, what, what does he mean there? Does he mean we're all running out having affairs? <clears throat> no, not in a physical sense, but often very much in a spiritual sense. You look in the Old Testament, Jesus often referred to Israel as an adulterous people because they had forsaken their first love, him, and traded it for false gods. And he called that adultery. Okay? And that's exactly the line that, that James is following right here. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Okay? We're trying to befriend something that is inherently hostile and opposed to our God. He goes on and says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you get what's being said there? <clears throat> this is critical to understand. The church, Christ's body, is not to share in common with the world. We're not to be their buddies. Okay? Now that doesn't mean you don't be friendly to your neighbor. What it says is do not spend your time, do not become like them. But pastor, Paul says I become all things to all men, that I might win some for Christ. He also says you don't sin. What then shall we say? Shall we sin all the more that grace may abound all the more? Absolutely not. Okay? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. No. No. But understand then that you can relate to them the gospel. Now, this is one thing that is critical to us. <coughs> all right? This is something I am praying daily. So hold on to your seats. Because I am asking God to make this church a place where goats come in and he miraculously changes them into sheep. Oh, okay, now that's going to cause a couple of things to happen to you guys. One... You're going to see people coming in that are not going to be your normal church folk, like I am, right? Okay? You're going to see people come in that have needs, that are lost, that are hurting, that may have ideas that are completely opposite to what we believe, that do not know God and are not known by God. They may know about him, and they may be feeling him drawing them. That's why they come. Our job is not to sit in judgment on them. Okay? We always get this confused. We totally twist this thing around. We don't judge the world. God's done that. All right? 
We judge the church. We look inside the church because Christ is coming for a spotless bride. And you cannot tell me that you love someone if you will not confront them in their sin. Okay? You're a liar. That's right. I just called you a liar. If your belief is you love someone, but you don't want to cause friction, you don't want to cause problem by addressing their sin, you do not love them. Okay? You speak the truth in love. All right? Both of those things operate together. They have to operate together. I mean, you look at some of the things that Jesus said in his ministry on earth. He was speaking the truth in love. He loved them enough to tell them, you brood of vipers, you son of a snake. So we've got to be aware that goats are going to be coming in. Okay. Now I don't know a whole lot about goats. I know what they look like. I don't really spend a lot of time around goats. I do have four boys. <laughs> and quite honestly, our neighbors had goats. The goats were cleaner. Okay? The goat pen was not nearly as bad as my boys' rooms oftentimes were. Okay? God wants to take them and do a transformation. Where it comes in as one thing and it goes out as something brand new. Okay? So now I want, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to ponder this. And I want you to write it down in the notes on the back of your bulletin. Okay? You ready? Why are you not inviting people to church? Okay? I, I want this to be an honest, insightful question. I want you to look into your heart. I, I'm, not, look, I'm not looking to build the numbers of Jesus Community Church. I'm not. Okay? I'm looking to build numbers in Christ's body. I don't care if people come to this church or that church. I want them to be in a church where the gospel is being preached, where the word of God is being preached without regret. I want them to hear what God desires of them and for them. So this question is not specific to this church. I'm asking, why do you not invite people to church? Okay? Because that's something we've got to address. We've got to address that. That's part of your testimony. Your part in the body of Christ is part of your testimony. God does incredibly miraculous things just all on his own. People being healed, relationships being restored, addictions being broken. But God also works through his body. You, you aware of that? I like Travis's quote. If it's just you and God, it's probably just you. I love that because I've been there. Been there, done that. Oh, I worship God better on my own. I get more out of reading the Bible than I do out of the preacher's sermons. And slowly as time goes by, I read less and less, I worship less and less, until basically Sunday was a day to sleep in and lays about the house. It very quickly became no God. Okay? God has designed and orchestrated it to work this way. We need fellowship. We need people to have our backs, to help us, to correct us, to walk with us. Okay? That's what the body is for. It's not to float somebody's pride saying, oh, look at the size of my church. It's not to tickle a fancy. I go to this church because they got good music. I go to this church because the pastor only speaks 18.5 minutes. I go to this church because we're out before the Baptists. 
<laughs> okay? That's not what this is about. This is about coming together to celebrate, to worship, to honor God, to instruct, to teach, to receive, to bless, to give, to honor. Okay? Going to church should never be a labor. Okay? If going to church is an obligation to you, check your relationship with God. Find out what's off. Find out what's messed up. <coughs> Okay? So, this battleground, the world is God's enemy. Number two, the world hates Jesus and his followers. Do you get that? If the world does not hate you, go back to my first point. Okay? John, chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. Jesus says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Okay? These are critical points that we have got to grasp. If we were of the world, they would love us. Does the world love you? Can the world tell there's something different about you? Are you a stench to them? Jesus goes on to say, Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents, and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. You get that? We are not going to be like. Okay, I'm going to read this again. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child. And children will rise against <coughs> parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Then there's that wonderful word. But. But. The one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay? One of the things that I, I struggle with is um, knowing how much to tell people in the world. I struggle with, um, you know, I, I see the errors that they're doing. Uh, just, just FYI, if you're curious, come see me after church because we had a, a little bit of wonderful graffiti left on our sidewalk out in front of the church Thursday. Um, somebody put a pentagram in a circle, wrote the number 666, uh, started to draw another pentagram, I guess they couldn't figure out how to do it, and then wrote, they are coming. Now, quite honestly, I, I don't believe there's a Satanist out there that, that's putting a hex on our church. Quite honestly, it doesn't matter, it doesn't, I don't care. They can't do anything to us. We have one that lives in us that is greater than the one they're serving. Okay? I think it was probably some foolish teenager just being foolish. But that doesn't make them any less used of Satan. Okay? That brought very sharply to my mind the war that we're waging. Okay? It's not just against the devil and his minions. It's not just against that part of us that has the capacity and even the desire to sin. It's against everyone who is not for Christ. It's against the system that is set up in opposition to Christ. And when we make a stand and we declare before them, we are His and no longer yours, they will despise us. 
Okay? They will move in opposition to us. I'm not even talking about, you know, society in America. Society in America hates us. All right? They don't get us. At best, they tolerate. But look at the movements that have been happening in the political realm over the last 40, 50 years. Look at where our society has come. I read an interesting article uh, by a pastor that was talking about how right now in America should be the norm, not 40, 50 years ago being the norm. 40, 50 years ago, coming out of World War II, um, actually that's moving up 60 years ago. Um, we had an incredible revival birthed all across America. People were coming back and celebrating the victory, celebrating being reunited with their families. We had an incredible revival going on at that time. That was the oddity. That's, that's not the normative. This is normal, where the world system pushes back against us and tries to do things to undermine us, to establish their own goals and their own priorities. Read the news. Look at the things that are being uh, passed as law. Look at what's before the Supreme Court that will determine what is right and what is wrong for this country. Okay? How much of God do you suppose they're getting into before they make their decisions? Okay? And we live in a society that is incredibly free in allowing us to worship. We live in a society that we have freedoms that a lot of countries have never had. Well, look at Europe. I mean, wow. That's where, where Christianity took its roots and, and exploded in growth. Churches are empty over there. They, they've, they've given up on that ideal. They've moved on to bigger and better things. And where they are, we are going. Okay? Look at Africa. Wow. Things are tough in Africa, especially for Christians. It's ugly. Ugly. Look at the Middle East and Asia. That's even worse than in Africa. That's the system that we are fighting against. This is the battleground that we wage war in. Okay? John chapter 16. Jesus says, I have said these things, that in me you may have peace. This is actually the, the scripture on the front of your bulletin. In the world you will have tribulation. Okay? You will have tribulation. Unless, of course, you're like an ostrich and stick your head in the sand and choose to ignore everything that's going on around you. Okay? Unless you choose to not take a stand for Christ, to not take a stand for God, you by not speaking forth of Him, you deny Him. Okay? Then things are going to go well for you. All right? In this world, you will have tribulation. Here's that wonderful world word again. But, take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Well, then how come we still have all the sin going on? The plan is not yet complete. The doors to the barn are still open that all who would be saved would be gathered in. When the barn door is shut, he will establish his kingdom. He will be the forever king of the line of David. And all those who did not accept will be cast to the outer darkness. All right? He has overcome the world. They can't do anything but what he allows. Now, he will allow some tremendous things to come on his church. Some incredibly painful things to come on his church. 
And ironically enough, it's when those painful things are happening that his church grows best. Because they have nothing to, to defend themselves. They have nothing but falling before him and begging him to intercede. That's the place where we need to be. Where we are at our uttermost weak. Our weakness is overwhelming. In that moment, his strength is made use. His strength comes into play. I, I read some of these stories in, in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Men facing horrific things. Women facing horrific things. With grace that just astounds me. I read um, in Voice of the Martyrs. People that were persecuting the church, very much like Paul, abusing, torturing, even murdering Christians, all of a sudden receiving a revelation and turning their hearts and lives over to him. A transformation that only he can do. First John chapter 2, go ahead and turn there. First John chapter 2. Pick up at verse 15. John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Okay? So the world has a lot of things to offer us. And, and quite honestly, in America, this is one of the greatest traps I've seen. Comfort. Comfort. I did not want to get up this morning. I went to bed. I was exhausted. I went to bed. Uh, Christy was reading for a little while, and, and she reached over and turned off the light, and I went, Bling. No, no, no. It's supposed to go the other way. When she turns off the light, my eyes shut. It, no. Boop. I spent a lot of time saying, okay, God, you've got me awake. Who am I supposed to pray for? Pray for this person. Okay, what do you want me to pray for them? Just pray that I'll move in their lives. What about, okay, I want you to pray for this person now. Okay, what do you want me to pray for them? Pray healing. Okay, I don't, okay. Uh, are they sick? Just pray healing, don't ask questions. Okay, God, God talks pretty abrupt to me sometimes. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll prevaricate around the bush. Okay, I was awake a lot last night. Uh, Christy got up at 6 o'clock to pray, and uh, I finally dozed off. And then she came in and said, sweetie, it's time to get up. 15 more minutes, please. I don't know, 15 minutes does not give me enough time to fall back asleep. Yes, no. So, I laid in bed, tossed and turned, God was prompting me, you need to get up, you need to get out and get praying, you need to get in the Word. God, I'm tired, my stomach hurts, I want to stay home today. <laughs> you don't know how close, Steve, you can't be getting a call this morning. <laughs> <clears throat> In America, it is so easy to love the things of the world. It's amazing the things that we love without knowing it. It's amazing the stuff that we love without knowing it. It's amazing the garbage that we love. <clears throat> I'm not pointing fingers at any person. So if this applies to you, I'm speaking generally and not specifically. But if you're watching very much stuff on TV, you're watching crap. If 
if you can't come to prayer because your show's on, or you can't come to the women's Bible study because your movie's on, or the brother's meeting because there's a good whatever, wow, you're settling for crap. <coughs> You, you are. Um, um, that's, that's just the honest truth. You have opportunity to come and celebrate and worship and fellowship with brothers and sisters, the Almighty God, and you can't miss your show. And I've seen some of the, the, the shows that are out there. Well, that's really not true. I don't watch TV. God convicted Christian and I of that a long time ago. Now, if you watch TV, that's between you and God. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to Choosing what you will do on this day. If your choice is God and something else, God should always be first. I'm not there. Don't think I'm speaking from a position of pride or arrogance. God is showing me more and more things that I've got to lay down. Things that insinuate themselves between me and him. Okay? But it's so easy in America to be titillated have these scratched by the things that this world has to offer. Okay? If you love those things, you don't have the love of God in you. Philippians chapter 3. Let's go ahead and flip over there real quick. So we're in Philippians chapter 3. Actually, you know what? I'm going to back up. I'm going to pick up in verse 12. Paul is writing to the church at uh, Philippi. He says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Okay? This, this is where we're at right here, okay? We have not attained this, but we are pressing in <coughs> to make it our own. Why? Because we belong to him. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we get into um, transformation. <coughs> Nobody's there yet in this room. <coughs> We are all <coughs> pressing forward. We're all pushing in. Nobody has yet achieved what God has for us in totality. Okay? goes back to that passage in Hebrews. He has forever made perfect those he is sanctifying, those he is making holy. Okay? This world is in opposition to the cross. What does the cross represent? Ultimately, the cross represents freedom. See, you have two choices in life. You can choose to be a slave unto God, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, willing to have your ear pierced to show that you belong to him. Okay? 
or you're a slave of sin. You're, you're a tool of the devil. That, that's the only two choices. Oh, no, brother, I do it on my own. Yeah, great. You're serving him with all your heart. <clears throat> okay? That's not one of the choices. You can't just go your own way. You are either a slave to sin, which means that's all you know how to do, or you are a bond servant to Jesus Christ, and you have, because of his nature living in you, the ability, the capability to resist sin. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But this world is an enemy of God. Think about that for a minute, an enemy. How many of you here have enemies? I mean, really, seriously, enemies. Personally, I don't know if I've got, don't think I do. When I was in middle school, I considered Bruce Garner my enemy. <laughs> he had a crush on Corey Brown, and I thought she was stupid. And she would say something in class, and I'd let her know. And then after class, Bruce would be waiting for me at the door. You need to learn to shut up. But really, what, we don't have enemies. Now, now consider for a minute what an enemy really is. Look at what ISIS is doing to Christians over in the Middle East. That's an enemy. That's, that's somebody whose sole purpose is the destruction of those that they are against. Okay. Now turn this thing around, and the world is God's enemy. They are in opposition to him. They have opposed him. But the reverse is true as well. God is opposing them. The world hates Jesus. The world hates the imitators of Christ, the Christians. Those who have declared him to be their Lord, the world will hate. Everyone that is a part of this world system falls into that category. All right? We are going to have trouble because of this. <clears throat> There's going to be people that come against us. You know, I, I look, and I told you a couple weeks ago, or months ago, or you guys know how bad my memory is going back. I remember what happened, I just don't remember when. I told you that I was amazed at how far this country has come in six years. I, it, it floors me. But we're not at the point that a lot of, a lot of countries are where there's just open persecution of the church. I mean, look, we're, we're gathered here right here. The doors are open. We're celebrating together. There's nobody breaking down the door, threatening to abuse us, to separate us, to, to torture or kill us. Uh, okay. Well, we're not really suffering a heck of a lot yet. I don't think it'll be too long before we do. Even enlightened countries, like the United Kingdom, Canada, have passed laws that we're looking at right now that are protecting freedoms and people, but really what they're doing is persecuting the church. Okay, great, fantastic, bring it on. I want the church growing. I want a spotless bride to be presented to Jesus Christ. I don't want one that comes in like Mackenzie's wedding dress. Well, if you were at the wedding, you know it was raining. <laughs> you know that the ground was muddy. I know it cost me a hundred bucks to clean the stupid thing. <laughs> okay? But it was dirty. And can you imagine presenting yourself to him with that? No. He wants it clean. And he paid the ultimate price to make sure it was clean. If we love the world or the things of this world, we do not love God. Okay? Well, Pastor, how do I know if that's a problem? Well, let me ask you this. Can you lay it down? Can you just say, Psh. okay, God, I won't do that anymore? Or do you struggle? God is telling you to put something down. Do you struggle with that? Oh, God. It's not hurting anybody. There's nothing to, come on. 
Well, you know what? It may not be hurting anybody. It may not even be overt sin. But because you choose to embrace that instead of lay it down, that nature right there is sin. Okay? So what may be sin for me may not be sin for you in that, that regard. Okay? But what may be sin for you may not be sin for me because I don't have a problem with it. All right? Enemies of the cross. See, we are set in a battleground that is completely and totally hostile to us. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize it was that late. Let me wrap up. See, this, this is the conclusion of my intro for spiritual warfare. <laughs> okay. Um, but really, I've got a lot more that I, that has, there's a lot of meat that I really want to get into, we're going to be getting into in the next couple of weeks. Because we looked at the enemy, know your enemy. The enemy is the devil and all his minions. But the enemy is also you. The enemy is also <coughs> this world. Okay? These three things are set up in opposition to us. To prevent us from, from gaining the things that God has for us, from doing the things that God desires of us. All right? We're set in a battleground that, at this point in time, is controlled by the enemy. Okay? The prince of the air. The prince of this world. But ultimately, God has the authority, and he has given us weapons that are mighty. One of the things that, that really bothers me is this idea that when somebody says, I'm going to pray for, pray for you, I'm going to pray about that, that it's like, well, I wish I could do more than pray. Really? Really? I mean, I may be able to answer some of your needs, but I cannot answer all of them. There's absolutely no way. But God can answer all of them. So if I intercede on your behalf and I petition God to move on your behalf, isn't that better than what I can do? I mean, God owns everything. You're in trouble? I, I don't own that much. God knows everything. You're having issues? You can't figure it out? Man, I got a small brain. Okay? God knows everything. I don't have to know. I can bring it to him and let him deal with it. God has given us mighty weapons. All right? We're going to get into this next week. We're going to start looking at the weapons of our warfare. Okay? Because we're not thrown to the lions in this battle. As a matter of fact, we are not overthrown in this battle except by our choice. We choose. Okay? So in the next few weeks, we're going to start looking at some, some scripture that talks more about warfare. We've covered know your enemy, know yourself, know your battleground. Now we're going to have to start doing some basic training. We do. Now you know what the purpose of basic training is, right? It's to break you down and remold you and shape you so that you can function effectively as a part of a unit to the advantage of your army. But we got to go to basic training to learn how we can best be used. Okay? I had someone tell me one time, oh, I hate these songs, Mighty Warrior, and we're, we're not called. God's the one that's going to do it all. Yes, he is. But scripture tells us over and over again that we are in a battle. We are in a struggle. It tells us to take up the full armor of God, not just the partial armor of God. The full armor of God contains things that are both offensive and defensive. All right? So we're going to go through, we're going to look at spiritual warfare. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, God, that it's because of you that we have victory. Father, even when things look grim, even when things look hopeless, we have victory. You have assured us of this because ultimately all things will fall before you. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And 
Father, on that day when your son returns, we will be a part of a mighty army that applauds and cheers as he accomplishes his will, his purposes, and brings about your kingdom here on earth. Help us, Father, to hold fast to the truths that your word has given us. Let us not be deceived. Let us not be dismayed by the power of our enemy because you have told us that the one that lives inside of us is greater than him. Help us, Father, to be mighty warriors on your behalf, standing firm against the darkness with the strength and the weapons that you give us. We bless you, Father. We honor you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>